Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, Asthma Grand Rounds and to wish you all a Happy New Year. And I also welcome those uh, joining us by live webcasting with a special shout out today to a uh, great asthmologist and founding member of Partners Asthma Center, Dr. Al Sheffer, who thought he might be able to join us uh, uh, in the Asthma Rounds uh, online. So, um, it was 2007 that the uh, expert panel of National Asthma Education and Prevention Program released their last set of asthma guidelines. And a lot has been learned about asthma and asthma management since that time. And consequently, we thought we'd put together our own expert panel to hear some suggestions for what might be appropriate in a new set of uh, guidelines or an update to the guidelines that might be forthcoming. So let me introduce to you this expert panel from Partners Asthma Center in the order that they will be speaking. First, Dr. Carlos Camargo, who's emergency physician at uh, Mass General Hospital. He's the founder and director of the Emergency Medicine Network. Uh, and he has been a past member of the National Asthma Expert Panels. And Dr. Elliot Israel is both pulmonologist and allergist, and he's the head of the Brigham Women's Hospital Asthma Research Center. And Wanda Fipitanicol is kindly substituting uh, for Dr. Ken Haver, who at the last minute was called away due to a death in the family. Uh, Dr. Fipitanicol is a pediatric allergist. She's a member of the uh, NIH-sponsored uh, clinical research network called AsthmaNet and principal investigator of the school inner city asthma study. And Dr. Aidan Long is a clinical director of the allergy and clinical immunology program at Mass General Hospital where he's also director of the adult allergy training program. And our format for this morning is going to be an initial presentation by Dr. Camargo about the process of guidelines development and the prospects for a new set of uh, asthma treatment guidelines. And then a series of three presentations by our experts about what they think might be included in an update to these asthma guidelines, what would be worthy of uh, including. And then we'd like to invite the panelists up to the front and invite you to participate, to share your thoughts and ideas. I thought this would be a little bit of outsourcing on the, uh, crowdsourcing, that's it, crowdsourcing on behalf of the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program. So we begin our program this morning then, Dr. Camargo. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. So I'm uh, starting us off here with an update on the guidelines and little background about what they are, how they got started, their purpose. Uh, the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program is uh, the group that's behind this. They're located within the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And this uh, program was initiated in 1989 with three goals, to raise awareness of asthma as a major public health issue, to ensure recognition of symptoms of asthma, and to achieve more effective control of asthma. And all of the activities of this program are based on a strong science base, uh, the healthy people asthma objectives, those are national public health uh, goals for the country. Uh, and they involve information exchange collaborations among a variety of groups, including professional societies, patient organizations, government agencies, specifically with national level educational outreach. And you're not meant to be able to read this, but these are all the different groups that are part of the NAPP. And as I mentioned, professional societies, patient groups, school-based organizations, and federal agencies. All of these contribute to the NAEPP. The clinical practice guidelines were first released in 1991, and our own Al Sheffer was a key part of this. Um, and in the years since, there's been a few reports on the elderly, on pregnancy, but the, the sort of the big publications are again the EPR, the EPR 2 in 1997, and the EPR 3 in 2007. And if you're interested in guidelines, the evolution of these three are interesting because the first one was allergists and pulmonologists sitting together, experts saying what they thought was good, which was pretty good. <laughs> Next one was more evidence and sort of like, let's bring everyone in to make sure that primary care is represented, emergency medicine, nurses, et cetera. 
it was pretty good. And the last one was the one I was involved in, which was a very intensive evidence-based systematic review tables and took years. Uh, and I hope you think it's good, but it certainly involved a lot of work and it shows you know, a slowdown that's very important now to, to consider as you create new guidelines. If this is the standard, it takes a lot longer than getting some experts together in a room and saying, what do you think is right? So with that background, uh, in 2011, the coordinating committee of the NAPP said that, you know, probably should get some new guidelines. Uh, guidelines may be deemed obsolete within five to seven years unless we do, you know, reviews. Uh, there has been a lot of clinical research. Uh, there's some knowledge gaps. We need an update. 2012, the National Heart Lung Blood Advisory Council did advise uh, that there should be a needs assessment before undertaking a guideline. You know, was there really a need to do this? And then last year, uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Advisory Council formed an expert panel working group, which was comprised of chairs of the different committees from EPR3, one member of the NHLBAC, uh, Polly Parsons, uh, and our goal was to create a needs assessment to sort of formally ask, is there a need to do a new guideline? These are the members. Uh, Bill Bussey was the chair. I think you'll recognize uh, some familiar names. Uh, the NHLBI staff were Jim Kiley, the director of the Division of Lung Diseases, Jenny Taggart, who has since retired, and Rachel Tracy, who's the director of the NAPP, the coordinator. To do this needs assessment, there were several important information sources. Uh, specifically, all members of the EPR3 were asked to rank uh, the recommendations and to prioritize them. So these are the old ones, and some of them were based on several randomized trials, other ones were expert opinion, and the idea was of these different recommendations, what do you think we should be updating? The coordinating committee also had a teleconference with a lot of different uh, groups, there were 35 attendees on that. They also had professional medical society meetings, uh, eight societies completed the process providing input. And then lastly, and this is an increasingly important part of NIH uh, activities, is public comment and there were 95 responses received. So all of this information was reviewed by our group, and we were charged to answer these three questions. Is an update warranted? What topics have the highest priority? And how might this update best be organized? So is there enough uh, evidence? Have there been enough advances to warrant a new guideline? Yes. I mean, I think that's obvious to everyone at the Partners Asthma Center and everyone who's listening to this presentation. But what? And we spent a lot of time thinking about the uh, priority topics uh, because we recognized early on that we weren't going to do a massive update of the guidelines. It just too, takes too long. It's too huge. And so we really should try to focus on maybe five topics. And this is the spirit of what happened in 2002, if you remember. There was an update where there was a focus on a few topics and, and trying to get out that information in a timely manner. Well, the topics we chose are listed here. Uh, the first is adjustable medication dosing and recurrent wheezing and asthma, which falls into the title of intermittent therapy. Uh, there's a lot of different variations. You're going to hear about more of them from uh, Elliot Israel. We also thought uh, long-acting anti-muscarinic agents in asthma as an add-on to inhaled steroids was another important topic. Bronchial thermoplasty was another important topic. Uh, fractional exhaled NO in diagnosis, medication selection, and monitoring of treatment response. Lots of data. We thought that was an important topic. And finally, remediation of indoor allergens, house dust mites, pets. And this was a topic that we in reading the guidelines and re reviewing the public comments and, and comments of some allergists, recognize that we probably should be making substantive changes to what we wrote before. And so we thought this was, again, a priority topic. All of this was framed with the, the PICO questions, as recommended by the Institute of Medicine, and those are, what is the population that affected by this? What's the intervention? What's the comparator? What's the outcome? And so we created a document that has all this information. But also, we did address several emerging topics that we want to acknowledge in this update, but we don't think are ready for a systematic review. And they're listed here. 
And, and this, each of these could be the focus of a partner asthma center grand rounds. Asthma heterogeneity, the emerging definition and application of phenotypes and endotypes. Biomarkers, other than FENO. How do you classify asthma severity? Biologics, immunotherapy, prevention of asthma onset, adherence, step down from combination therapy, specifically referring to ICS and LABA, and then the role of community health workers. And so we all felt that these should be part of the update, but that they wouldn't be priority topics with systematic reviews. But we would certainly highlight them and provide a few references for the, the people who read the guidelines and, and to let them know that these are sort of evolving important areas. The next question was how do we organize this uh, to ensure the appropriate partnerships with all those groups in the NAPP? And we advise that the NHLBI should continue to coordinate the guidelines within the, with the NAPP to ensure impartiality, credibility, and acceptance of the product. Now this may seem obvious to some of you, but there was a lot of concern within NIH, and specifically NHLBI, about this whole guidelines business. Uh, you may know that the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has other organs and other diseases, <laughs> And there was a lot of controversy about some of these other guidelines emanating from NHLBI. And a concern, you know, why are we in this guideline business? And one of the things that we in this expert uh, working group really pushed, and a lot of the comments from the public and other groups said, was that we really liked having the NAPP as an impartial, neutral, evidence-based home for this. And we didn't think that this should be something that was given to one society, that asthma wasn't like that. It really needs to be inclusive, and, and we like the system. And we tried to argue as best we could that, that this was a good model, notwithstanding some of the other problems with the NHLBI guidelines. Um, we did recognize that the organizations would need to be more engaged, to have an implementation plan as a requirement for being a partner. Uh, and that, of course, they would critically review the, the report uh, before endorsing it, and that's always been the case. If you want to read our needs assessment report, it's available online. This is a s screenshot of, of the, the document uh, in, uh, on the web, uh, but it's there for you if you want to read it. And it has those priority topics, including more details, including the PICO, et cetera. So there's much more than I can cover in this short talk. So to summarize, uh, in April 2014, our working group recommended conduct an update, focus on five priority topics, and that yes, NHLBI with the NAPP should coordinate it. In June, this was presented to the Advisory Council, who in consultation with the Heart Lung leadership thought that we needed public comments on our needs assessment. So that has just completed. The last comments were submitted last week. Uh, next week, we're having another conference call. We're going to discuss these comments, revise the needs assessment as needed, and then it'll be presented again to the NHLB Advisory Council next month. Uh, hopefully, the, it'll be affirmative. I think it will be. Uh, the heart lung uh, will make leadership, will make a decision. They'll inform the NAPP. And here in my final slide, I'll show to you the series of steps that inevitably follow. And this is government. <laughs> so here's where we are so far. You can see create the needs assessment, get the comment, the public comment, the decision in form NAPP. Then comes the following. Uh, we need to make the commitments with the NAPP partners. Then an expert panel working group needs to be identified, not just us with the needs assessment, but who are the people on the new EPR for? Or really better termed EPR update. It's going to be like that 2002 update. There'll be a draft. There'll be then uh, NAPP input, public comments on that draft. The advisory council gets a comment. There's a revised draft. It goes back to the NAPP. And then finally, it gets published. So you know, all of this takes time. And so I think the optimistic timeline is 2017. And uh, with that, I will stop. and. Uh, give the floor here to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Elliot Israel. Thank, thanks so much, Carlos. Uh, that was a great overview uh, of what's happening. And um, Carlos and I didn't talk beforehand. Um, but I see the first topic <clears throat> is the one that I chose in terms of what needs 
and needs to be changed. And um, um, I have a proposition up here, and the reason I have this proposition up here is that um, most of you realize that um, the guidelines call for patients who have more than intermittent symptoms to be treated with um, a controller, and that most commonly that controller is an inhaled corticosteroid, and we prescribe that inhaled corticosteroid currently under the recommendations um, once or twice a day, depending on the type of inhaled corticosteroid we use. We also know that if one looks at patient um, refills, that patients actually refill their prescriptions about three times in a year. And so patients are not using their inhaled corticosteroids regularly, although we keep prescribing their inhaled corticosteroids regularly. And the question becomes, are there better paradigms for doing this? And what I want to do is propose that um, what the guidelines may need to think about is that as needed inhaled corticosteroids triggered by albuterol use should be introduced as a first step for mild persistent asthma as a step down for those well-controlled on inhaled corticosteroids, and potentially as a treatment paradigm for patients with occurring exacerbations who, despite regular use of inhaled corticosteroids, probably are not complying and actually may do better if they actually know when to take their inhaled corticosteroids. And what I want to do is uh, I only have, we had 10 to 12 minutes. Um, so I, I'm going to basically very quickly go through the data that I think support this um, and actually show you some data that has been used to kind of say no, no, and explain why that data is really not what it's, what it's supposed to be showing. So and I'm going to show you th um, three studies with adults. Um, the first study, which is not exactly what uh, I'm talking about, but I think laid the groundwork for it, was um, a study that was done by the Asthma Clinical Research Network. Um, Homer Boucher and I led this, and this was a treatment of mild asthma in adults where we actually tested the proposition of whether you could use, not use inhaled corticosteroids um, on a regular basis. And so patients who had mild asthma were randomized to inhale budesonide 200 micrograms um, twice a day plus oral placebo, inhaled placebo plus oral zafrilocast, which is an anti-leukotriene, and inhaled placebo plus oral placebo, but all the patients were taught to initiate short courses of oral or inhaled corticosteroids, and it was really inhaled corticosteroids that they did on a base of a symptom-based action plan. And they basically were told when you started developing more symptoms in, um, above a certain threshold, there was, um, they were supposed to start inhaled corticosteroids. And the patients were enrolled in this for a year. Um, and the results were that um, according to self-report and according to their pill bottle returns and their inhaled corticosteroid counters, they actually, the patients who were actually quite adherent, 90% adherence, which meant 47 weeks of budesonide, 90% adherent to zafrilocast, 47 weeks per year of zafrilocast, and the as-needed people, um, the people who were on placebo and therefore only received inhaled corticosteroids when they d started them by these um, uh, by the symptom-based action plan, use them for 75% of the episodes that they should have used them, which was 43 episodes, which was 1.25 weeks a year of um, inhaled corticosteroid. So there was a 97% reduction in inhaled corticosteroid use. You'd say, oh my God, that probably needs to be, there would be a big, huge difference between these groups. This group is only using inhaled steroids for about a week and a half a year. Well, <clears throat> so the proportion having asthma exacerbations. So this is the percent of subjects who had asthma exacerbations that were described as needing to either use um, higher dose inhaled corticosteroids or oral corticosteroids. And you can see here that there's not much difference between the regular budesonide group and the group that it wasn't using budesonide and was PRN. There was no significant difference between these groups. There were about 100 patients in each group, and the p-value is 0.445. But even more interesting, look at the oral corticosteroid use, which is the way we define exacerbations in most of our studies now. And the oral corticosteroid use, if anything, was lower in the PRN, but certainly was not greater than the um, PRN. So we demonstrated that if you had patients doing this in a smart way, they could actually, at least in terms of um, exacerbations, be as well controlled as if they were using inhaled corticosteroids twice a day. Now, there was no difference in peak flow. There was no difference in quality of life instruments. But there were a few differences. So continuous inhaled corticosteroid, the patients who were on continuous inhaled corticosteroids, they reported two symptom-free days more a month than the patients who were on as-needed inhaled corticosteroids. They also had lower exhaled nitric oxide, and they had lower speed of eosinophils. So there are any other studies that kind of looked at this. So there are another two studies that I'm going to show you. This is a study by Pappy and his colleagues that was done in Europe where they actually had a um, albuterol inhaled corticosteroid in one canister. 
And what they could do is say to patients, okay, you're going to actually just take this canister and you're going to use it whenever you feel like you need to use your albuterol. And what's going to happen to you is you're going to get a shot of inhaled corticosteroid at the same time. And so they compared um, <coughs> the patients who used, and this is um, exacerbations, and they compared as needed combination therapy. So combination therapy is that one inhaler where they're using their inhaled corticosteroid and albuterol to regular beclomethasone therapy, so where they gave patients beclomethasone twice a day to regular combination therapy where patients were given this <clears throat> twice a day to use which had albuterol and um, beclomethasone in it and told to use the um, as needed or as needed albuterol therapy. And as you can see, the as needed combination therapy um, was as good as regular beclomethasone therapy um, in terms of exacerbations. Um, now what happened in terms of inhaled corticosteroid use? So inhaled corticosteroid use in the as needed group was 75 percent less in the triggered group as compared to the regular group. There was no difference here in this study in symptom-free days. There was no difference in rescue medication use. The symptom scores between regular and triggered were exactly the same. So in this study where you now had them together and you always use with albuterol as opposed to our prior study where you had to think about whether you, you had reached your threshold and where, th where a quarter of the time the patients didn't even do it with their threshold, this study, these were equivalent. Um, and then. <clears throat> The Asthma Clinical Research Network then did a subsequent study after our impact study um, where the impact study was done in mild patients. We said, let's look at more moderate patients, patients who are on inhaled corticosteroids but fairly well controlled. Um, and so we took those patients and we, we randomized them into three groups, one where we put a rubber band around albuterol and inhaled corticosteroids since we don't have a combination therapy here in America um, to use, um, and one where we, the physicians would bring, we'd have them come in every four weeks and the physician would adjust their um, inhaled corticosteroids based on the NAPP guidelines of how symptomatic they were, and a third where we'd measure their exhaled nitric oxide and adjust them based on their exhaled nitric oxide. This was all done in a double-blind placebo-controlled way. Uh, there were dummy N M F E N O values and there were three, three sets of inhalers. And basically, if you look here, this is the, ex the event rate of exacerbations. Um, this is the physician assessment-based uh, exacerbations. This is the biomarker, F E N O assessed exacerbations, and this is the symptom-based exacerbations. So you can see that patients who were only using their um, albuterol with inhaled corticosteroids did at least as well um, as any of the other um, quote-unquote best paradigms that we have now. And what was the um, inhaled corticosteroid exposure there? 50 percent less inhaled corticosteroid use of the albu albuterol triggered thing. No difference in peak flows, no difference in symptoms, no difference in FEV1, no difference in AQLQ, no difference in ACQ, no difference in the as asthma symptom utility index. So the biomarker base where they were tr where they were done against um, FENO had lower FENOs, but they also used more inhaled corticosteroids, and they were being targeted to their lower FENO, but that didn't produce any better outcomes. So to summarize, in adults, depending on the paradigm, you get a 50 to 95 percent reduction in inhaled corticosteroid use with no significant effect on exacerbations. When the albuterol triggered paradigm is used, there doesn't appear to be an important difference in symptoms or control. How about kids? And I think kids are a little bit, can be a little bit different. Um, and so this is a study that was done, um, uh, there was a report from the CARE Network where they looked at exacerbations of wheezing and respiratory tract illness in children. Um, and what they did is um, these kids took um, uh, budesonide, um, a half a milligram uh, once a day versus a twice a day um, one milligram budesonide when they had symptoms. And they were, again, they were coached um, about early symptom use. And if you look at the frequency exacerbations, there was no difference in the frequency exacerbations. If you look at the time to first exacerbation, the blue being the daily regimen, the yellow being the intermittent regimen, no difference in that. Um, the frequency of treatments for respiratory tract illness, no difference in that. Um, and the time to first treatment for respiratory tract illness, um, again, no difference in that, although maybe you could say there's a little bit of um, an increase here in the intermittent regimen, although in the end, not any different. How about their exposure? So 66 percent decrease in inhaled corticosteroid use. There was no difference in episode-free days. There was no difference in the days with albuterol use. There was no difference in terms of the quality of life domains. Um, another study that was done um, which, and there wasn't any difference um, in height, although that was a fairly short study. Here's um, a study that was done over a year it's called TREXA, um, and they showed that there were reduced exacerbations in the continuous and combined in PRN inhaled corticosteroid use. So this is combined inhaled corticosteroid use, this is daily, this is rescue, and this is placebo. And this is placebo, and these are the other three. Um, the, this study was, um, had about 70 patients in each group, um, and the hazard ratio for having an exacerbation in combined therapy, 
um, which was um, albuterol and helicobacterioid versus placebo, was 0.56, which reached statistical significance. The rescue back was 0.62 um, and didn't quite reach statistical significance. But you can see what it looks like. So again, there's a significant reduction, but it, more interestingly, so what? It, so you got that, um, you got a greater reduction when used inhaled corticosteroids regulating these kids, but not that much greater a reduction. Um, but what you did find is there's a 1.1 centimeter difference in height over the year, because um, there was a 75% reduction in inhaled corticosteroid use in the PRN group, which obviously wasn't occurring in the combined group. So there's no difference in asthma control days. There's no difference in the ACT. There's no difference in the quality of life. There's no difference in bronchodilator use. There was an increased FENO of about seven parts per billion. There are two pediatric studies that are, um, that are so just to be fair, there are two pediatric studies that were included in the Cochrane Review um, of, um, of intermittent use of inhaled corticosteroids, which were used to say that, you should, that maybe there's not enough evidence to do this. And I would argue that those two pediatric studies are flawed um, in the way that they were done, and I'll go through them. So this is um, a study done by PAPI um, in which they used nebulized as needed combination therapy versus regular therapy, um, and the nebulized beclomethasone on all exacerbations in preschool wheezers over 12 weeks. And um, it looks like the, um, it is the, the regular inhaled corticosteroid use is actually better than um, the PRN inhaled corticosteroid use. But this is a very different paradigm, and the issue becomes one with, as to whether, how this can be used in kids. When you're talking about nebulized use and saying that the parents were going to set up a nebulizer to use out combination albuterol inhaled corticosteroid each time the, patient, the, the, the kid has symptoms, you're not going to do that except when the kid has a lot of symptoms, which means that actually the PRN part of this didn't end up being used in a PRN way because um, that, that's not the way it's, it's going to happen. So I, I don't, I'm not surprised at all by this. And there was an 8% increase in symptom-free days with the regular use as compared to the other. But I, I don't find that surprising. The second study is an even more flawed study in terms of comparison. Um, it's placebo with nebulized budesonide exacerbation. So basically, these patients were on placebo, and they were told to start nebulized um, budesonide when they had an exacerbation. And they looked at the rates of exacerbations. And it's not surprisingly, they found that um, bud um, budesonide um, actually did not reduce the rates of exacerbations. But you weren't telling the patients to use the inhaled corticosteroid until they had an exacerbation. So clearly, you waited until the patient had an exacerbation, then you told them to have budesonide. There's no way that um, you'd reduce exacerbations, which is why the rate of exacerbations is no different than the rate in the disodium chromoglycate group, which we know doesn't reduce exacerbations, because um, basically this was an intervention that was post-fact. So, um, and this, um, <clears throat> And that study was used again by the Cochrane Review um, in terms of its analysis. So my pediatric summaries and studies where inhaled corticosteroid use is triggered by albuterol use, we know exacerbations are reduced um, compared with no treatment and close to the regular use of inhaled corticosteroids. The growth resembles placebo, um, so that's actually very significant. But we know that inflammatory markers might be increased. And so um, I think um, in the 10 minutes I had, achieve you can achieve outcomes as good or better as current paradigms for initiating or stepping up therapy. And we should probably be talking about introducing this as a first step for mild to moderate persistent asthma, because that's what patients do, except they don't do it smartly. We should think about this as a step down for those well-controlled on inhaled corticosteroids, because they probably don't need to be, the majority of them do not need to be on regular inhaled corticosteroids. And we might think about this as a treatment paradigm for patients with recurrent exacerbations despite regular use of inhaled corticosteroids if they, we think those patients may not be complying. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much. So I'm pinch hitting for Ken, and he gave me um, a couple topics, but with only 10 or 12 minutes, I'll probably focus on just one. But the title of my talk is, Can Asthma in Children Be Managed at Home, Particularly in the Yellow Zone? So the EPR recommendations in kids, um, their first recommendation is really that you should have a written asthma action plan. And the yellow zone um, generally is determined by the increased use of SABA. And so far, the guidelines in kids have shown that two times ICS is not effective, but that questionably four times ICS may be effective. The guidelines also say to just jump to oral steroids if SABA is not adequate. So there's some gaps in kids in the recommendations. And as you can see, you know, it was nice to see Elliot give a little overview of some studies in kids, because a lot of the studies are flawed, and a lot of them are very difficult to do. Um, but the recommendations, uh, the gaps, is that this um, going straight to steroid use after having um, symptoms obviates the yellow zone. So the patients go directly from green zone 
right to the red zone directly. Um, and at home, you know that patients spontaneously up their doses um, of inhaled steroids anyway, so why not provide some evidence to guidelines? So I think that is important for us to kind of address in children and kind of consider of evidence to empower them to potentially treat uh, these kids in the yellow zone at home. Oral steroid bursts, there are concerns. Actually, it's actually controversial in um, viral uh, exacerbations in little kids that steroids even help. Um, in fact, one of the studies that we had looked at in AsthmaNet um, was looking at that, but we were had a difficulty recruiting for the study because many uh, kids are just routinely treated with oral steroids, and so we weren't even able to um, complete it. But there are some um, studies in the New England Journal uh, by Ducharme that have actually questioned the use of oral steroids in viral-induced exacerbations. And then there's always, in kids, we worry about side effects. You know, there's a linear growth and things like that. So this is just an, a picture of what the yellow zone is. And, and the question is, if you early intervene, like at the start of a cold, not waiting till an exacerbation like Ellie had mentioned, but early on, can you actually reduce the risk and the length of time of the exacerbation? Um, and this just kind of shows, like, if you intervene early, you can probably slow down or even stop the process. Actually, in just uh, this year, um, there was a practice parameters that really found this that important that it was an asthma uh, gap in the guidelines um, regarding the yellow zone. It's actually called management of acute asthma control in the yellow uh, zone. And so as you can see, it's the plan is to stop the attack before it goes into the red zone by treating with the yellow zone with the step up therapy and hopefully alleviating um, the disease. Uh, exacerbation. These were the criteria. Now, I found that most of the criteria is B evidence or less because really we don't have a lot of randomized studies um, evaluating to give a A ev evidence. But the yellow zone is an increase in symptoms, an increase in reliever medications. Again, just like Elliot mentioned, the Saba use, not so much waiting until you're ready, like impending towards the red zone. Um, peak flow declines. Um, and um, onset of a viral RTI if it's a known trigger. They're also, the presence of uh, nocturnal symptoms is also um, a criteria for the yellow zone. And so that's uh, been established, but with again, with B evidence, not really A, which is a randomized controlled trial. This is a study that was done by the CARE Network in kids. It's the PAC study combining um, evaluation of Montelukas, uh, the combination uh, inhaled steroids, and Montelukas and fluticasone. And the goal I wanted to show just this, this study is that the, the um, symptoms actually vary and actually peak towards the start of the prednisone burst, and that they gradually return to baseline um, at, over the course of several days, even up to a few weeks. So that it might be, if you started this therapy or whatever your intervention was in the yellow zone, that it might be prudent to do, treat even longer, so maybe a couple of weeks. Um, but a lot of research is uh, needed, particularly in children. So I propose that probably um, a false start might be preferred over a late start, just, um, and that tied in nicely to Elliot's first talk, that if you promptly recognize the symptoms and start the yellow zone strategy for two weeks, that may actually alleviate. Now, there's a challenge in kids, because they're not going to tell you their symptoms. The young ones, you know, often they won't get started right away. But I think that might be uh, reasonable. And um, Rob Lemansky wrote a, a nice little article about some, s some kind of strategy that, that we could consider in step-up therapy, such as step-up long-term therapy, where you do it for several weeks, step-up intermittent short-term therapy, where under brief uh, loss of control, you do it for a couple of days, or then step-up intermittent therapy um, as um, approaches. And in the guidelines before, it talked a lot about step-down therapy, but we might want to think about trying to prevent them going into that red zone. And we need some evidence for, for that, and particularly in children, there are not so many studies. Um, so the intervention strategies would consider the scheduled dosing, which is increasing the ICS dose for like a day, um, or dynamic dosing, which is increasing the ICS um, along with reliever um, uh, based on symptoms. And then there's adjustable maintenance dosing as well, which I thought uh, was one of the top topics that Carlos had mentioned for the guidelines, which I think is really, really an interesting concept where you kind of increase the symptoms uh, and adjust it um, uh, by symptoms and then come back down again. Right now, the EPA guidelines just say go to Saba and then go straight to OCS for kids. So we really probably need to have um, uh, evidence-based looking at these different dynamic intervention strategies in the yellow zone.
Um, one study that actually precipitated a study that we're doing in AsthmaNet right now for kids is does um, quadrupling the dose of ICS at the onset of a URI actually reduce um, steroid bursts or exacerbations? And there's only one study in adults that was actually the basis for a study that's ongoing now in children, is that 2x ICS didn't seem to work, but quadrupling the dose of ICS at the start of a URI actually did reduce the exacerbation. Now, I saw another part in the guidelines that needed to be talked about was adherence. You can see this difference was only in the patients that were actually adherent. And I think that also is, is, is worth mentioning as well. So uh, we have an ongoing study now in kids where actually at the start of the onset, we're actually quadrupling the dose of ICS, actually to 5x ICS in the yellow zone to see if we can reduce asthma symptoms. And I see some of my staff that are working on the study have joined in on the talk. So um, what about the preschoolers? Um, again, it's B evidence, um, but in general, um, using, considering, um, initiating high-dose ICS or even oral Montelukas at the start of the signs of a wheezing illness or, you know, again, um, increasing symptoms could reduce the intensity of the symptoms. So, um, and particularly in those with the uh, modified API. I think something that um, should be considered too is, you know, who are those kids early on that we identify that might go on to develop asthma? And so the asthma predicted index has been studied a lot, and this just reminds you it's related to allergy, family history, and some other things as well. This is a study in preschoolers that again compared, again shows that curve of like, you know, you start it starts to have the exacerbation, and then uh, the symptoms really peak, and that there's certain interventions that may work uh, better in, in you know, reducing that curve and bringing you down. Um, and so this was one uh, in, in preschoolers showing that uh, compared to conventional therapy, mo early Montelukas and Budesonide um, could, could um, help in, in the yellow zone. This study, Elliot already described uh, quite eloquently. Um, it was nice that he reviewed some of the pediatric studies, but this also kind of talks about that concept of this yellow zone rescue medication and that um, the most of the side effects, so we worry about this in kids a lot, were um, with the daily and combined um, dosing, but if you use the rescue, you can see that the curves are also different from placebo as well, and that it might be um, May, may reduce the time to exacerbation and should be con considered. And again, these are just in school-age kids. We really need to know what, what to do about in, in the younger kids. Um, this was um, a review also of all the different studies with dynamic dosing. And as you can see, the star, that's the only one in kids. There's really a, a paucity of information. And I think a lot of it is, you know, some of these studies are very difficult to do. Um, but in comparison, that dynamic dosing or adjustable maintenance therapy in, in many studies, most of these were in adults where they compared budesonide and Saba, um, Laba ICS and Saba, um, you know, uh, budesonide, formoterol, plus even formoterol as a rescue uh, therapy. Um, and uh, as you can see on the different bars, they had comparisons. And it seemed like the exacerbations were reduced significantly across the board in those who used um, like a, a LABA ICS as a maintenance and also as a reliever as well. Um, but the evidence is still very um, scant uh, in children, children. In this study, it, it included both adults and kids and showed that that uh, dynamic dosing may, may help. What are some concerns about the um, adjustable dosing? There's really no FDA approval at all for adjustable dosing. Many of the studies that I quoted were turbo inhalers and devices that are not even available in the United States. Um, many of the studies actually looked at dosing three times above the FDA-approved dose. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the ICS LABA thing, but I think you all know there's this FDA box warning. There's a lot of question in kids, should we be using uh, LABA? I think it's pretty clear now that we're supposed to use LABA in, com in combination with ICS. Um, there are concerns that the symptom-driven approach may not be feasible in patients who are poor perceivers of dyspnea and that it actually may be detrimental um, to those who overuse their inhaler during periods of symptom increase. 
So um, I was trying to look at uh, Cochrane reviews of this type of strategy in the yellow zone, and lots and lots of studies in adults, and um, only a f um, seven randomized studies in children um, that showed that there were f uh, significantly fewer asthma-related um, adverse events in taking um, regular um, ICS LABA compared with ICS alone, and that there are no um, d significant difference in all uh, severe adverse events in adults. So considering this adjustable um, maintenance dosing in adults seems, uh, seems reasonable since there's a lot more studies and data than in adults. However, in children, they uh, acknowledge that the data and number of events was really too scarce to draw uh, any meaningful uh, conclusions. I should say, too, also there were some deaths uh, reported as well. And there's always a little bit of concern about the ICS lava. And we're, we're, um, I think there are ongoing uh, studies looking to see if there's certain genetic um, predisposition to um, the adverse events with those. So in, the, in summary, the yellow zone, I think it's mostly B evidence. I think it might be something worth considering from a pediatrician standpoint, because families would love to consider being empowered to treat their asthma at home before getting into the red zone. Um, but there's no A evidence yet, and we're doing a study now to look at that step up yellow zone therapy. Um, I think everyone knows that people should have an asthma action plan with the traffic light and knowing when you're starting to know when you're in the yellow zone to start the therapy. Um, and that patients in general, at least from all of our work in, in a controlled setting and studies, that patients are able to start their therapies at home and potentially pr um, prevent a, a, an exacerbation that gets them into the hospital. Um, to know when the yellow zone is, to activate it um, at a known trigger, to escalate therapy. Um, the SABA, which is in the old guidelines, is really kind of more C evidence now, and so thinking about other strategies prior to just going straight to SABA. Um, considering increasing the dose force X ICS over 24 hours, and that preschoolers with um, high risk, particularly API, um, should consider ICS or leukotrienes at the onset. Um, and with mild to moderate uh, asthma, you consider symptom-driven use of ICS um, with SABA or even LABA, uh, considering uh, during the yellow zone. And what is the best step up therapy for children? I don't think we know. We're actually in asthma and also doing a study that's across the ages that Elliot's leading in blacks, where we're looking at different strategies and the best asthma therapies to use when, when patients get get ill as well. And hopefully, over the next few years, maybe by the time the guidelines come out, we'll have some actual evidence to help guide the guidelines. There are a ton of questions remaining in kids that I think, um, I was excited to see that the indoor allergens and environmental allergen exposures is on the list. Um, I was just telling Carlos about all the work in the schools and homes that we are doing. But these are just a list of some of the others, and I think some of them hit on the same head. Um, and I want to give Aiden some time to talk. I promised him I would, so I'm going to stop now. Thanks. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Chris had asked me to focus on um, novel therapies that might be uh, looked at by the new guidelines. And I think uh, it's an important topic, but it's an important topic to have in context. Not every patient with uh, severe or difficult to manage asthma needs new medications. And I think we should, when we see a difficult asthmatic, take a step back and think about what we're dealing with rather than saying what new medication can we add. You can typically divide your severe asthmatics, those who have difficult to control disease, into one of two categories. Those who are not really a candidate for new therapy and those who are. Uh, what I mean by that is there may be other factors con contributing to their severity rather than a lack of novel medications. And what I typically would do and recommend that the guidelines might focus on is having us take a time out with our severe asthmatics, step back, and go through a checklist of things that may be contributory. I break them into five categories, asking the question, is there an adverse environment? Um, is the patient adherent? Is there a comorbid condition that's contributing? Is the diagnosis of severe asthma actually correct? And only then is there a need for alternative medications in these patients. I'm going to focus on the second and the fifth topic here, but I'll just introduce to dismiss the other three. An adverse environment could be an allergen, an irritant, or another pharmacologic. So we need to step back, review the environmental history, review the treatment history, uh, and perhaps do an allergy evaluation if it's not been done. Think about comor comorbidities that may be making this appear like severe asthma, 
in the paradigm of the acid reflux, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, uh, access, uh, chronic sinus disease, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, Sherg Strauss, ABPA, uh, smoking, and maybe do some other studies to address those. And ask the question, is this truly asthma or is it glottic dysfunction of some sort or other issues going on, chronic respiratory infections, bronchiectasis? And then we're left with these two big categories. Is the patient adherent to what you've prescribed? And as you've seen from some of the data presented already, this isn't always the case. And only then are there alternative uh, pharmacologics warranted. I'm going to address the issue of, of adherence. I was perhaps disappointed to see that it was relegated to a topic for discussion rather than a major focus, because I think this probably is the biggest single factor contributing to difficult to manage asthma. I put together a number of studies from the last uh, year or two that have focused on this under a number of different he headings, asking firstly, uh, what is the scope of the problem with, uh, in asthma with respect to adherence? Uh, what are some of the practicalities of solutions? And what would be the potential impact if we could improve implants? Um, in terms of the scope of the problem, a study that came out in Jackie earlier this year uh, looked at patients who'd had exacerbations from the medical expenditure panel survey and then looked at what medications they were actually taking. And if you take patients with asthma exacerbations, all comers, only 29% of them had been taking a regularly prescribed controller medication. 54% of patient, patients who met the criteria for asthma exacerbation had never had a controller medication prescribed. There's a huge need to increase uh, adherence with medications here. Uh, another study that looked at electronic monitoring of patients who'd had twice daily uh, controller medication prescribed found that only about half the half the time, somewhere between 49 and 54 percent of the days, were they actually using their medication as prescribed. So there's a huge problem with adherence. How can we address this? A very interesting study came out also in Jackie this year where a device developed in New Zealand was applied to the inhaler that gave two bits of information, a reminder to the patient and also feedback about their behavior when they were complying, when they were not complying. And this was compared to patients who were given personalized adherence advice. So this was a group of 43 primary care practices, about 150 patients. The primary care physicians were educated, the patients were given a questionnaire, and then based on that questionnaire, an individual counseling session about adherence was given to the patient. This was compared then with the device on the inhaler with no counseling versus usual care. What was observed was that at six months, the compliance rate with the feedback device was 73% versus 46% uh, when there was um, personal counseling provided, but also there was a decreased exacerbation in those given the electronic monitoring. If you looked at personal advice versus usual care, there was no difference. So counseling didn't do very much, but this electronic device did. This might be something that would be useful in the, in the future. And what also came out from these two studies, the parent study and the foster study, was that we really, did, we really do need to change our paradigm along the lines that Elliot presented and Wanda too. Maybe the idea of um, adjustable maintenance therapy is what we need to do. And I'm glad to hear that's the major topic of focus. Because what, what patients actually do and what, patient, what physicians prescribe them to do, do not mesh at all. Patients do at home adjust their medications. They step down their medications far more likely, far more frequently than we would like. But they also step it up when they get symptoms. So if we could change the paradigm and make our recommendations similar to what the patients actually do, this would be very helpful. And a very nice review by um, Beasley and Jackie looked at this, uh, all the data on this in adults and observed that they, for, uh, when this single inhaler maintenance and reliever therapy is used, that there's improved outcomes, less use of steroids, less cost, less side effects, and less patients being pushed to the right-hand side of that step-up paradigm in the uh, most recent guidelines. Uh, a very nice study uh, by Zafari looked at what would be the implications if we could achieve full compliance with BID dosing, and they estimated that there'd be a 31% reduction in the uncontrolled weeks, uh, asthma uncontrolled weeks, 
and a 40% reduction in exacerbations. So it's a huge topic. And uh, um, Eric Bateman, in a nice editorial in this year's Jackie, also said this is really the last frontier of asthma care. So this is a huge step that we should address before we go ahead and focus on novel therapeutics. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the, Europe, the, uh, the guidelines, the international ATS ERS guidelines um, on severe asthma published just this year in the European Respiratory Journal, they make the very bold statement that it's been estimated that 90 to 95 percent of patients will achieve symptom control if the following steps are in uh, are in place. Smoking cessation, proper prescription of ICS and LABA, and optimization of drug availability, which means availability of generic drugs, improved adherence, and improved administration techniques. So you're left with about ten, 5 or 10 percent of patients who may need novel therapies. So a really a small group. Then what are these newer therapies? Well, it's important to think carefully about those. There are current treatment options that have not been addressed in previous guidelines. There are modifications of existing drug categories, and then there are new biologics that may have a role in the future, but probably not at this time. Um, and this is where the relevance of asthma subtypes and the response predictors or biomarkers become relevant. If we look at the first topic, um, and I'm glad to hear that both of these are planned to be addressed by the new guideline from what Carlos says. The role of the long-acting uh, muscarinic antagonist is clearly important. As you all know, teotropium is approved for use in asthma, and it's been shown to have adjuncting act adjunctive activity uh, over and above ICS uh, by Steve Peters, published in 2012, and over and above what ics lava combination can achieve uh, by Kirsten study in the um, New England Journal in 2012. There are several other anticholinergics that have been approved for use in COPD, aclidinium, glycoporonium, and eumeclidinium. Uh, these will also be studied for asthma in the near future. And then bronchial thermoplasty. You may be aware that a five-year follow-up now has been published following on from the initial trials, showing that the, the benefit in reduction exacerbations is sustained over five years. So these two issues clearly are existing drugs that have not existed, existing treatment modalities that were not addressed in the 2007 guidelines, and I'm glad to hear they're both major foci of the uh, updated uh, guidelines that Carlos uh, mentioned at the start. Um, the second category is modification of existing drugs, um, including improved delivery devices, uh, combinations of inhaled steroids plus long-acting muscarinic antagonists, combinations between LABAs and long-acting muscarinic antagonists, and the, the role of ultra-long beta agonists. Um, ultra long acting in Decaterol, and uh, one study, nice study by Anne Woodcock, looking at um, Vilantirol and Fluticasone 4 8, comparing it to Adver, showing equivalence. The, the benefit here is once daily use and possible better adherence or compliance. And there are studies going on with dissociated steroids. These are so-called soft steroids, where you can decrease the side effects and maintain efficacy. So these, these things are already under clinical study and uh, may warrant some addressing in the new guidelines. Only then do we think about the novel biologics. There's a lot of data. I'm not going to review it for IL-5, um, some for IL-4 and IL-13. Um, one disappointing study looking at an anti-IL-17 alpha receptor, a nice study in the uh, last year from uh, Gail Gavreau at an anti-TSLP, and some other novel drugs in development, CCCR3 antagonists, CXCR2 antagonists, and a TLR9 antagonist. All of these are in clinical studies, but in early phase clinical development. But in terms of new therapies, biologics, it's not going to be addressed. I think that's appropriate because at this time, other than omelizumab, there's no uh, biologic in asthma that's currently approved by any regulatory agency, and they really have no place in this time in guidelines. In the near future, they may be useful in patients who have frequent exacerbations if they meet a specific uh, phenotype. So with that, I'm going to, going to stop and hopefully uh, join the other members of the panel at the front. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. It's great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for provocative uh, ideas about uh, what's coming ahead in our guidelines for asthma management.
it's a good opportunity for us to open it up to you and see what thoughts you have, uh, uh, things that have not been addressed that you think should have been addressed, ideas that you'd like to share with uh, us or with the future expert panel. I think one of the uh, themes that we heard a lot about was the uh, intermittent use of uh, inhaled steroids. The possibility the person with mild persistent asthma would not take a controller therapy every day, but would begin therapy at the first signs of respiratory symptoms. And what dose will we ask the patient to begin and for how long? And how will we protect the patient and family from the misconception that this medicine is to be delivered PRN? that intermittent does not mean as needed in the sense that we use an albuterol for PRN use for rescue. So, um, Chris actually, um, Chris actually, I think what I was advocating was that it be used, PRN. Um, yeah, PRN, let me just be clear about my question. Uh, we have lots of patients who have a, a red inhaler that they use for quick relief and a, a, a brownish inhaler that they're asked to take two puffs twice a day every day. And my fear is that the steroid inhaler might be used like the albuterol as needed. Take a couple of puffs if you're short of breath. If you're not short of breath, you don't take it. That isn't intermittent therapy. Intermittent therapy is twice a day every day for two weeks, as I understand it, during this exacerbation. So at least the data that I was showing, um, and I went through it quickly, was intermittent therapy as you didn't describe it. Um, so it, it is actually you know, using your brown inhaler whenever you feel like you need to use your red inhaler, and doing that throughout the year, and basically auto-regulating your inhaled corticosteroids. And the paradigm is that inhaled corticosteroids are actually a PRN medication. Um, and the problem is, and the, the nice thing about that is that when you use them for symptoms as you would use your albuterol, that it appears that you start them early enough that you actually are able to prevent most exacerbations to the extent that you prevent them as well as you would if you were taking your inhaled corticosteroid twice a day. I um, mean, I think that's the piece. It's, it is the PRN use. And the, the push should be getting pharmaceutical companies to actually develop these combination albuterol and steroids, so the patients are not using a rubber band and switching sides to take their steroids and their albuterol, and that the only prescription we give them, again in terms of patients and patient compliance, is one, where you give them this, and then in terms of the dose, um, that's where it may come in, and so the patient who's more moderate Maybe the patient who gets the 160 inhaled corticosteroid with his albuterol as opposed to the 80 um, with his albuterol. But at least that's the paradigm that um, the data suggests actually works. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. I think, Just make sure it's on. I think the key is having a single inhaler that provides both relief and administered corticosteroids. And uh, there are combinations available that have rapidly acting uh, bronchodilators such as formoterol which is in uh, some of the available combination therapies. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that this label, intermittent therapy, includes many different approaches, combinations, transitions from chronic state to exacerbation, which Juan referred to as the yellow zone, but the yellow zone could also be a chronic state. Um, I think there's a lot of complexity here. And so the, imagine the guidelines. And these are guidelines. These are not rules. They're meant to guide clinicians and making decisions. Imagine trying to capture all that uh, complexity for everyone. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. And one of the reasons we stuck to five was because one actually <laughs> is about you know, five. So I'll just uh, leave it there. Dr. Ravy. So first of all, I, I thought the, the discussions were fantastic. I, I think you guys covered a lot of stuff. Um, it seems to me that before we can change the guidelines, we have to have the tools readily available to anybody. So if we don't yet have a, 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 a nice armamentarium of combination rapid-acting therapies that could be deployed easily, it'll be hard to make the, the guideline change. And similarly, you know, I think the, the, the adherence issue, 
I, I've never understood why that has not been emphasized more and not been at the forefront. Adherence is, is everything. Um, and adherence not just with medication use, but also with environments and being strict about things. Um, this whole idea of having a digital and electronic uh, sensor, there are a lot of people who have been talking about these types of things, and we've certainly been talking about how you can engage um, smart technology and so on. But again, until those things are really deployed and out there, it's hard to put them into guidelines, I would think. Um, so we have to think about how to do that um, and can the guidelines be used to advocate, you know, other aspects of the healthcare provider network to, to change their behavior, like the pharma companies? Uh, I did want to respond to, some, to, to Aiden's presentation, which I think we would all agree is good asthma care. If you look at the original guidelines with the steps, on the bottom of that, most of it is there. The problem is that when those steps are reproduced and disseminated, it's only the drug part that right. it ret is retained. But look closely again at those steps, and for many, many years, they have specifically, people have been advised to assess for the environment, to look at comorbidities, to deal with adherence. In response to your question about adherence, we, we added the adherence at the end because we also all agree that it's critical. The problem is, are we ready yet? Are you ready yet to make a recommendation to all healthcare providers on how to achieve that adherence for all people in a concise way? You have two sentences. <laughs> it, it's a tough challenge, but it, it cannot be ignored. I completely agree with you. I think, I think I'm not sure that it has to be anything more than being really vocal about it in the guidelines. And, and maybe the fact that it's at the bottom, you know, that's what you're stepping on. On can I take, building on top of it. Can I take one minute to respect the questions submitted online from those uh, viewing by live webcasting? There are two. One had to do with the role of expanding allergen immunotherapy in the setting, for instance, of incoming sublingual treatments. And I'm hoping we can table that for a future Asthma Grand Rounds presentation, which is in the books and a whole topic in and of itself. And so here comes the other interesting one that had to do about the problem with use of high-dose inhaled steroids having to do with cost. And what about the role of comparing high, the uh, long-term effects of high-dose inhaled steroids versus oral steroids, which are far cheaper? And I think that's the essence of the question. Uh, do, we, do you know of studies of shorter courses of oral steroids instead of higher dose inhaled steroids, presumably in the setting of exacerbations, because there's a big cost differential? Um, well, and I think an important thing that's, that Wanda highlights is until that last edition of the guidelines, the entire exacerbation section lived within the pharmacology section of the guidelines. So I think in 2007, we made, took a big step forward where we divided chronic care into adults and children and had its own section for exacerbations. What Wanda highlights now with the yellow zone and with the work of the parameters is that there's actually something in between chronic asthma care and a recognized exacerbation. So that exacerbation chapter says use corticosteroids because the assumption is you have an exacerbation. But now you're saying, well, wait, there's something in between. You could be in the transition. And it may be that we need a new chapter, which is that early transition between the chronic care and the full-blown exacerbation. And that's, advanced. that's an important advance, I think, in asthma care. But again, it'll be very hard to summarize this neatly for, for everyone. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the question that the listener was asking, um, it's clearly more expensive to use um, high dose inhaled corticosteroids. Well, I, I shouldn't say it's clearly. Um, it, it, um, if you go up to six or eight puffs twice a day and use that for five or ten days, that's going to use your whole inhaler, which is going to be two hundred dollars, whereas the prednisone would have been five dollars. Right. So it, it is clearly more expensive. The downside is that we know when one looks, for instance, at osteoporosis, that the use of corticosteroids is cumulative. That one can predict the loss in bone density just by adding up all the amounts of corticosteroid that has been used. 
So saying I'll do a five-day course one month and a five-day course two months later and do a five-day course um, six months later, um, you're paying the price of having used oral corticosteroids and just add, add them up. Um, so there is a downside to, to doing that um, and one needs to think about that long term. All right, well thanks again to our panelists. Terrific job and thank you all for participating.